excited to be chatting with Cliff. Unfortunately, Giuseppe uh, learned this morning or yesterday that a friend of his had passed away, and so he is not going to be making it today. So that's um, not so cool. But Cliff mm -hmm. is uh, an awesome friend of ours. Uh, he's a South African. He's a former colleague. He's a former Spotify coach, and he is now co-founder at the Flight Levels Academy. And he's currently living in Sweden. And we thought it would be cool to chat to Cliff about what's been going on for him and get another perspective uh, on, on what's happening. So, so Cliff, um, personal perspective, Morning, how's it been going? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, it's been good. Um, yeah, uh, Sweden has been a little bit in the news because of a maybe slightly different approach to, to dealing with things. Um, but yeah, it's been... It's been interesting experiencing it from the inside and sort of watching everybody else from far away and the outside. It's, I, was, I was actually in South Africa in February and got back here uh, right at the beginning of March. So just as everything was getting crazy. So I got a little bit of a taste of how South Africans were experiencing things as it was just kind of taking off and then came back here to see what, what was happening on the other side of the ocean. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. Cool. And, uh, and, and, and what's happening in Sweden at the moment? How's, how, does, how do things feel? What's been going on there? Yeah, it's interesting because, so, I mean, Stockholm specifically, which is where I'm based, uh, I mean, we haven't had any official lockdown. So it's, it's not been like South Africa or a lot of other countries where people have been forced to stay home. Um, it's basically been the government. So it, one, one thing about Swedish people that's quite interesting is generally the sort of as a percentage of the population, the number of people who respect the rule of law and trust the government is one of the highest in the world anyway. And so when the government says, we expect you to do some things, uh, people tend to follow those rules uh, as a general guide. Um, and so, I mean, that manifests in a bunch of different ways, but specifically in this case, what's happened is the government has basically said, like, we'd like you to stay at home um, and try to social distance, but we trust you to use your own judgment and decide when and where you go and so on. Um, they've banned, you know, large scale events. Uh, a lot of companies have, you know, stopped going to offices, all of this kind of stuff. Pretty much all the supermarkets, like the standard, you know, they've got distance markers on the floor and all of those kind of things seem to be fairly widespread. Um, mm -hmm. But you can still go to a park, you can still go for a run, you can still buy booze and cigarettes, um, you know, all of these kind of things. And so it's, it's been an interesting contrast because, yeah, it, it makes for some fun poking fun at friends, you know, mm. when they're running out of wine. Um, I'm sure you haven't run out yet, but, you know, um, <laughs> some of us plan ahead. So anyway, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting for sure. What, what's, what's it like at, in the restaurants? I'm curious about that. What's, what's it like? Yeah, so the first couple of weeks, it was super quiet. Basically, everybody just freaked out and didn't go anywhere. Um, all the bars and restaurants were kind of open, but to, you know, very small part of the restaurant, that kind of thing. So there was no official government mandate you have to close. Um, mm. And that creates an interesting challenge because uh, like in, in South Africa, at least if the government says, you know, you have to close, there probably is sort of a stronger expectation that there should be some kind of financial assistance or, you know, that sort of responsibility because you're declaring a state of crisis. Um, Sweden has kind of done that, but in a different way. And so a lot of people have been kind of been questioning like, well, will we get the support that we need? That kind of a thing. Mm. Um, Restaurant traffic has been massively, massively down. I mean, I haven't, I haven't been to an actual restaurant since I've been back. Um, I went once to a bar last weekend, which is a huge outdoor place, and had a beer in the sun uh, with a friend. Um, but outside of that, you know, most people are not going out. It's people are out and about in the streets, but they're far apart from each other and not hanging out in huge groups really so much. Although it's starting to pick up a bit now because I think there's this this sort of sense that. Uh, you know, when, when the numbers start declining, everybody goes, oh, well, the two things kind of happen. One is people go, oh, everything's back to normal. And the other mm -hmm. thing is that people start asking, well, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad overall. Did we, over, did we overreact kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, come on. But <laughs> it is interesting to see how it's gone. It's fascinating. Um, so what do, you, what do you think is um, going to persist? So like I've seen some novel things happening and I'm, I'm interested in, things that other people have seen that yeah. are that like ways of coping with all of this that are going to kind of stick around. What do you, what are you seeing that you think is going to stick around? So I think it's interesting because a lot of people have been asking this question, what, what changes as a result of, of coronavirus? And um, yeah. I, I, I kind of see it in a slightly different way is that a lot of what's happened is that basically it's accelerated certain trends that were already persisting. Um, mm -hmm. So 
I, I've been interested, um, there's a guy by the name of Aaron Levy. He's the CEO of a company called Box. I don't know if any of you know him or know, know of his company, but um, it's basically Dropbox and Microsoft Office, like all of those sort of packages, but on the internet. And they're, they're targeting a corporate market. They've been enormously, enormously successful. Um, and he's, I mean, aside from being funny, uh, he's also quite smart and connected into the industry in an interesting way. And one of the things he was saying is that if you look at the trends of, um, like there was that meme that was going around of who's driving your digital transformation, the CTO, the CIO or COVID-19. Um, and I think the reality is that for a lot of organizations, it is actually COVID-19 that's driving it. Um, companies that hadn't experimented, I mean, even Spotify, to be honest, like they had a policy of generally speaking, you know, n not working remotely, although there was a lot of technology that was set up because people are in sort of, you know, 15, 20 different countries. So yeah. you've got video conferencing, you've got Slack and this kind of thing, which makes the transition easier. But as far as somebody sitting at home on a VPN, you could, you can access it, but it's not really built for long-term stability of those kind of things. So um, of course the company has now shifted. A lot of other companies have as well, just saying, well, we've got to, we have no choice, so we have to at least try it. And I think a lot of companies have realized that it's actually not as hard as they thought um, mm. and that there's a lot of benefits. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, in terms of longer term trends, I, I think um, certainly a lot more people probably being remote is kind of an obvious one. I think a lot of people will see this and kind of go, there's a lot of advantages to it. Uh, mm. I do think a lot of the, the sort of idea that everybody is going to shift to being remote only is perhaps a little bit overstated. Um, because oh. I think after nine or 10 weeks of, of being at home, people start to realize actually there's quite a lot of cool stuff about seeing some humans every now and again. Um, I mean, it yeah. depends a little bit, you know, are you more extroverted, introverted? How much do you like being around people on a regular basis and what quantity of that do you need? But um, I think for a lot of people, it would be, you know, it's nice to have a space to kind of, especially those with kids and family who, you know, now you're taking care of them all the time. It's like, I just need a bit of space to get away from that um, mm. and kind of, yeah, go hang out with some work people, have a water cooler conversation, this kind of thing. So, but there's of course other ways to solve that. You don't need an office necessarily to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just easier in an office because I was wondering about, um, like I think in some organizations, a lot of the informal networks and informal communication pathways are almost what drive um, a mm. lot of how things get done in organizations. And so it's, it's, um, I'm kind of wondering about what's happening um, now. And I'd love to hear some stories from people about what's happening, about how, how are people dealing with those informal networks and informal mm. communication pathways? Because, yeah, I saw someone moaning about that, actually. Um, someone was telling a story about how, yeah, all the informal communication pathways are now all of a sudden gone. And it's like, actually, that's how we used to get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, I think this is interesting because, I mean, there's, there's two things I would point out. One is um, sort of open source networks and how they work, you know, people building open source software. And the other is if you think about most of the time you spend in an office, is it spent socializing or is it spent doing other things? Um, mm. I, I think a very small amount of the time that we spend in an office is actually spent building trust. Um, there's usually specific activities that we do that are formalized around that. And usually they're planned ahead and somehow facilitated. And I, I do think it is a little bit harder to do it virtually if you've never met somebody. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I see more of a blended environment in the future, perhaps where you do something like you get together every so often um, or, at, you know, kind of the, the beginning of your employment, you meet the team, you come together, you get to know each other, that kind of a thing. Um, mm. And then, you know, being able to have a, an ongoing interaction. I mean, you think about us. I mean, you know, we haven't seen each other in super long time. We don't see each other all that often because you're not always in Sweden. I'm not always in South Africa. Um, mm. But the friendship that we built from years past, you know, allows us to continue having a good relationship and we can chat about things. And it's, you know, it's not the same as if you see each other face to face every day for sure. But um, there's a lot of things that can be interesting in that space. Um, mm. the, the other thing was around the open source software. And I think um, if you look at a lot of people kind of when Wikipedia became a big thing, people couldn't understand like the sort of the prevailing wisdom was that everybody wants to get paid for their work. And if they're not getting paid, they won't do it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it interesting when you talk about performance management, because that, I mean, that's a side on topic, but you know, nobody's going to work unless we pay them for it. Yeah. Look at Wikipedia, look at all of the open source software, look at, I mean, there's, hundreds of thousands of examples of people giving away their expertise. I mean, right now I'm not being paid for this, um, you know, and it's, it, yeah. And it, it's, that's not like, I mean, it, it doesn't really affect people's sort of ability to, to do these kind of things on a regular basis. Um, 
But what's interesting is that a lot of the tooling and the way that things are set up is that you are still relying on some sort of a personal relationship. I mean, the fact that I'm here is because we know each other. Um, mm -hmm. And probably the other speakers who you've had and the ones you'll have in the future will be people who you've met somehow or at least got to know a little bit um, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the, the sort of preceding weeks and so on. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You know, the, the tools for collaboration look different when you're trying to do it asynchronously. And a lot yeah. of the pain that people are feeling in the current climate is because they've basically just taken what was a face-to-face -face meeting and put it on a video call. And yep. quite frankly, that's a crap way to adapt because what works virtually and what works in person, I think are fundamentally different. Yeah, um, all the dysfunctions that you had in a virtual space are just amplified in a remote space if you don't change things. Yeah. Wow. It's a lot harder to notice them because, you know, things like, I mean, most of the people are not on video now. Uh, and that's actually quite common in a lot of sort of work meeting contexts. You know, people don't turn their video on and stuff. So you can't, you can't see what people are up to. So if, if the meeting is kind of boring, I can just check out. I mean, I, I used to do it a long time ago, you know, on client calls or whatever. And you're just sitting there and somebody's waffling on for 45 minutes and I'm making breakfast or I'm picking my nose or whatever. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you because... You, you know, and it's nice in a way to be freed from that burden of having to sit there and be try to be 100% present when everybody knows that it's actually not that engaging. Yeah. Um, but it highlights that a little bit more. And I think people sort of like, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll find some better tools than always yeah. having to talk. I think so. So one last thing I want to ask, and that's what's one thing that's helped you get through this all so far? What have you, what have you, what's your secret? What have you been doing that's been helpful? Um, I find myself on this roller coaster of like <laughs> all the emotions and all the things going on for me. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean that's an interesting one. I, I think so. I, I was in a lucky situation. So uh, about a year ago, I I started doing some consulting work, um, and from February, the beginning of February this year, I had planned to to basically pause that uh, and switch to doing the Flight Levels Academy. So the, the idea was to start a new company from, well, it had started already, but to be full-time in it from February. And so from a, I think partly from a financial perspective, but also like mentally, I was prepared to be maybe not at home, but to shift my focus. Um, and so I've been really lucky in that sense that, especially I think from an economic sense, like not so stressed. If I was trying to find work and stuff, that would have been really difficult. Um, and I, I think that there's something very interesting that I, I hope a lot more people, I, I mean, not everybody has the opportunity to be able to do this, but to, to learn how to be prepared for this kind of thing from a financial perspective. Um, I think that is one thing. Um, there, there's a, a quote from uh, Nassim Taleb that I quite like. It says, the, the three most harmful addictions are heroin, carbohydrates, and a monthly salary. Um, and it basically, the, the challenge, I think, is that a lot of people get so used to it. And you see it when, I mean, I, I notice it with friends around here who've had, you know, retrenchments or, you know, companies going on furlough or something like this. People going like, well, what do I do now? It's like, yeah, like, you know, the, the question was not like, if this is going to happen again, it's more a case of when. And I don't say that to be sort of fearful, but you need to think a little bit about that future and kind of plan ahead for yourself. And one of the interesting things that I, I think will come out of this is, is some of the, I don't know how much you know about UBI and these sort of concepts, but I think there's a lot of interesting things that we could explore in that space. Um, but yeah, I think more than sort of being luckily rather than intentionally sort of pre-planned in some other way, um, having Fiona around my, my wife and being able to build mm -hmm. that relationship even further. I mean, you know, we would see each other when we see each other, but now we've spent several weeks. It's probably the longest consecutive period we've spent together in our entire relationships. Um, and it, it's been great because now we know even more about, you know, every call, you know what the other person's up to and you sort of chatting and you can make lunch and you can wake up and go to mm -hmm. bed together and everything is kind of all connected in a different way. And I, I think that's been really powerful. I don't know if that kind of answers your question because I feel like maybe we're looking for something a little bit different. But no, um. <laughs> I just want the perspective. I think everybody's got their own perspective and everybody's mm. got their own thing. So that's awesome. Um, I, I'm also, I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is that there's these spouses from different um, industries that are all that are all working together or all working at home at the same time, should I say? They're not working together. They're working at home at the sure. same time. Sure. And I think their work is going to become interestingly in interconnected. And I wonder what uh, interesting learning there'll be that comes out of that and interesting um, 
transfer of, of knowledge and information and maybe even ways of working. Yeah. yeah. I think part of what's going to be interesting in the future is that you're finding a lot of people who haven't been in this sort of a context before. I mean, quite practically, I've, I've solved for, you know, needing a physical space. We have a desk in the bedroom, which Fiona's using, uh, and that's all set up. Uh, I had a desk in, in it's, kind of in our office space here, but I've actually built a separate space here, which is where I sit when I'm, you know, having video calls because the backdrop mm -hmm. is different and I can have the microphone and all of this and the lighting and stuff set up. Um, so those are kind of sort of practical and physical things, but I think also from a technology and a tooling perspective, you know, if you, if you try to have a stand up using Jira over zoom, I don't know. I mean, it really just doesn't like there's, there's more to it than just the tools, but there's a lot of kind of clunky stuff about that. And I think with a lot of people being put in a space where they have to interact with that day to day, uh, you know, smart people who have the means to be able to solve it both directly in that the sense, like I'm a software developer, I can fix that problem, but also in the sense of like, maybe I have the ability to solve a problem for somebody else. And because I'm experiencing my partner's pain, I get an yeah. ex a sense of what that is. And so I can use my expertise to solve their challenge and vice versa. And so I think you get this sort of, um, I guess it's kind of like a diversity of perspectives somehow coming together to try to solve these challenges in a way where your partner wouldn't be overhearing your call and seeing your facial expressions where you're going like, oh, when that person says that thing, or, <laughs> you know, when you're really excited about something, knowing what that is, like you're, you're much more connected to the other person's context. And I think that creates a lot of really interesting um, kind of collaboration and connection opportunities. So. And yeah, and lots of interesting possibility, I think. Yeah. No. I think a lot of people have realized that, you know, many things that they would previously have got on a plane to go and have a meeting for or get on a, in, in a car and go and see their client or uh, their team or whatever, realize that if, if you've done some homework and you've built the relationship, you can actually bridge some of those things by just having a quick call. Um, mm. And I've noticed that even with friends, you know, you just kind of at the beginning of lockdown, there was kind of this, oh, we have to schedule a time and we make a plan or whatever. But now it's just like I randomly pick up the phone. And it's like call somebody because I, I know they're at home and if they're working then fine that you know they don't have to answer or whatever but you can just have a chat and say oh, i'm making some lunch what are you up to cool i'm in the garden doing some stuff like and you just have yeah. a chat in a more informal casual sense and those sort of patterns I, I would never have done that before in the same way so yeah it's gonna be exciting it is for sure um thanks very much cliff for joining us and for being our guest this morning we appreciate it sure. um I'm going to hand over to Peter. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, maybe if anyone does have a question, they want to um, uh, stick their video on or um, put a cue in or. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks Joe. And thanks Cliff. Very interesting. Um, a lot of uh, interesting personal perspective and um, uh, I was chatting to a friend of ours in Portugal yesterday, and I think similarly, a lot of things are opening up uh, there as well. So hard to judge whether people think that uh, this is kind of not as bad as we thought, or it's just a need to get back to some kind of normality. But I guess a question I have is um, the economic impact. I mean, you know, a lot of people are talking about that the economic impact is a, is maybe a bigger problem even than the, than the disease, not, not minimizing um, the impact for people who've, who've lost people. But w what's the sense in Sweden or maybe elsewhere if you're in touch with others? Yeah. So, I, I kind of give a disclaimer. I, firstly, I'm not an epidemiologist. I, I'm not an expert on economics or any of these things. But my my view on it, or my 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 sense from understanding what Sweden is trying to do, is that Sweden has talked about this idea of saying um, the the state as its whole sees its responsibility as being responsible for people's overall health rather than just to strike try to stop the epidemic, if that makes sense. And so, what they're weighing on one hand is like yes, there are some people who would die if we don't address this immediate crisis. But if we do address it with a lockdown, there are other deaths that will occur because of economic factors, because of mental health factors. Um, I mean, suicide is one of the biggest challenges in countries like Sweden and the Nordics. Um, you know, and so this is definitely increased when you have a situation where people are stuck at home and have no social interaction. 
um, stresses because of you know job loss and these kind of factors have longer term effects. And you know, on one hand, it can sound a little bit like weighing you know people's money versus people's lives, um, and that's not really the argument they're trying to make. They're just saying that it's life, it's lives lost in a coronavirus situation or lives lost you know over the next five ten years as a result of other effects. And if we try to consider that sort of holistic thing, um, I think it becomes a slightly different conversation. And it is tempting to say, well, we need to solve the immediate right now thing. But if you make the problem worse down the line, and you cause other kinds of challenges, and I think in the South African context, for sure, you have this kind of a challenge, you know, I mean, right now you have people who don't have food, you know, if they cannot leave the house, they cannot get food. And so they will die of literal starvation. And you're saying, well, you know, there's only a few hundred folks who have got coronavirus and died. How do you weigh that versus, you know, the other folks who are dying of starvation? You, you have to consider this. And it, it does, I don't think it becomes sort of a, an either or situation, but looking only at one set of data gives you a single view into the problem. And what I, I quite like about the way Sweden has approached it is that saying that there is more to consider than the virus. There are longer term effects. There are even shorter term effects that are sort of unrelated. Uh, or, or not obviously related. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's something that I've found quite fascinating in, in terms of sort of the different approach. Honestly, I don't really know where I stand on this. Like, I, I I am thankful that I'm not the person who has to make these decisions. I don't, you know, I don't envy the the presidents and and epidemiologists and those folks having to make these very very tough decisions in a hurry with not always a lot of information in advance and it's like you know it's not that we weren't expecting something and i think that's the one thing that we should take away is that like this wasn't something that was a oh where the hell did it come from it's it happened faster than we thought but we should have seen this coming because a lot of people have been saying that this has been something that will happen and like i say it's also not going to be the last time maybe it looks a little bit different but you look at the countries that have been quite good at dealing with it they've had some preparation at dealing with these kinds of situations um, and I, I find it quite fascinating to look specifically at the us and the uk at, at how the general public is responding but how the governments are responding and you know i mean i have obviously some opinions uh, uh, about that sort of system and that setup but i think it's quite fascinating to see um, you know how it's how it's played out and the country that can absorb this kind of thing, I think, is definitely more resilient uh, than one that completely falls apart. You know, people freaking out because they can't get their hair cut and that they, they want to go to the gun range. I mean, that's just absurd. Like, uh, you know, people who've never experienced any kind of oppression running around complaining that they're being oppressed because they can't buy toothpaste. Like, I mean, come on. So, but I don't know. It, yeah, I'm not trying to convince you of my political views, more just I find it surprising how the human race can can have these sort of strange views on what what oppression is. I mean, I, I saw a video of a South African guy protesting that he couldn't surf at Musenberg Beach and he's comparing it to apartheid people walking around with passes. And I'm just like, no, like you, you can just shut the hell up and go away. Like it, <laughs> you, no, so I don't know. I don't know what it's like to 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 experience you know real oppression either, but I, I, I'm not trying to compare my experience. Like, yeah, I would rather be able to get out and go around and do cool stuff, and you know, have some aspects of of the previous life that I had back. But I'm also aware that if I do that, and if everybody does that, people will die. And I don't know. It, to me, that doesn't seem like such a bad trade off. Stay at home, watch Netflix for a little while, you'll be okay. Okay. You know, I'm one of the lucky few who's in a position that can actually do that, you know, and for those who aren't. Yeah. Mm. I don't know if that kind of answered your question. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's great. And 